Oh, hi, everybody. Welcome to another nice evening of chemistry uh, for Chem 103. So today is going to be a little bit different um, in that I don't have a, a specific topic to talk about. Uh, we're going to do that next time with the balancing equations worksheet, but it's pretty simple. I think you'll get that. Um, but we'll go over it anyway next week. This week, I want to talk about the biodiesel project, what that's going to involve, and um, how to get ready for it and how to kind of get started with it. And then this week in lab and next week, this week for half of you, next week for the other half of you, you will be analyzing your biodiesel, um, which should be uh, which which should be a lot of fun because it's it's neat to know how that stuff actually works and 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 how it how it would perform as a fuel. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at. So what I have behind me here is just this week's um, activities, which you can see is, is pretty sparse. Uh, remember, there's also the assignment folders, uh, the assignment folder. But the the main part here is the biodiesel project. So the first thing I wanted to do today is just take you through what this looks like and, and what that biodiesel project is ultimately going to uh, be. Sorry, I just took my phone out in case you all want to send me some Discord messages, which you're welcome to do. All right. So, um, so what you see here in this biodiesel project folder is a bunch of different uh, things, <laughs> really. So I can see how that's that's a little bit daunting. Um, the main thing that you want to look at is this thing that's in green, the biodiesel project final analysis. So let's take a look at that first. All right, so this is the biodiesel project. Um, this is what you're ultimately going to turn in. You've done a bunch of lab work. You're also going to use what you've done in lab to answer some of these questions. Um, so we're going to get a bunch of experimental evidence to th see if we produce this stuff or not. And we'll talk about that um, probably in, a, in two weeks after we've actually done the experiments. We're going to calculate some masses uh, that we're going to do tonight and um, yield. And then we're going to talk a, a little bit about the experiment coming up on Wednesday. Um, I, I may go through that those calculations. I may save that for another time. We'll see how see how much time we have. Um, but this is what you're ultimately going to do. Several of these are calculations that you should be able to follow right along with me and just plug in your own numbers from lab, um, and that'll be fine. Other ones should be researched. So you know, biodiesel is a fuel. What's the purpose of a fuel? Why is this considered a renewable fuel? I want those answers in your own words, but also researched. So don't just like assume that you know the answer and then just say that answer. Um, you know, actually actually go look for what that stuff means. Um, so you can go through those and and look at that stuff. And if you have questions, certainly let me know. Uh, it, a lot of this will make more sense after you do your lab, either this Wednesday or the Wednesday after. So that's the main the main analysis part uh, that you're going to be working on. What we're doing on Wednesday are these first two entries right here. So the experimental uh, analysis, which is really more just a summary of all the different things that you're going to do to analyze your biodiesel. Um, so there's all these different ways that we can see what it's made of. And um, a wash test where, just kind of take you through these for a second so you know what's coming up. Uh, the wash test is you're mixing the fuel with water. And if the fuel layers separate very clearly, then we know that there aren't other um, surfactants and other types of molecules in there that are causing an emulsion, that are causing the oil or the biodiesel and the water to mix when we want them to separate very cleanly. So the longer it takes for them to settle out into two layers, the more impurities are still in there. Um, the methanol test, the fuel should be totally soluble in methanol. But the vegetable oil that we started with is not soluble in methanol. And that's an issue of polarity, which we talked about um, last, last week or the week before. So when we add the fuel to the methanol, if there's no evidence of anything else floating around, any undissolved oil, then you know that your reaction is completely done and there's no leftover starting oil. Usually, most 
people have a little bit of starting oil left over. And that's just because I think of time constraints, that we can't really let the reaction go quite as long as it really should, which should be more than an hour, um, just because of the time of our lab. So for cloud point, we want to know how low of a temperature is this fuel good for. Uh, one of the drawbacks of diesel fuels in general is they tend to crystallize. They start to form wax crystals at low temperatures and not like super low temperature, like temperatures that actually it gets outside in the wintertime. So we have to um, figure out how we're going to determine what is the temperature where we can first start to see those crystals. So uh, you can kind of develop a plan to do that. It shouldn't be too... Um, too complicated. You'll just be, you know, cooling it down and trying to figure that out. Uh, density. Develop a plan to measure the density. So that's going to take a little bit of work because uh, you want to know what is density. How is, is density measured? Um, that's all research that you can be doing to get ready for lab on Wednesday so that you know how to do that. And then the spectroscopy and the gas chromatography mass spectrometry, we will do that um, probably the way those instruments work, I, I think I will have you just make a sample up in lab on Wednesday and just because of time, and I will run the samples at another time um, so we can, uh, so you can, and then I'll send you the data for those. And then what you're going to actually be spending most of the time on Wednesday doing is measuring the heat of combustion. So the heat of combustion is how much energy the fuel has in, in it, in its chemical bonds. And that's directly proportional to how effective of a fuel it's going to be. So we definitely want to do that. Um, notice there's not many directions in here. That's actually a fairly complicated procedure, and we're going to um, do it. We have a whole separate procedure for that. So let's pull that up and take a look at it. So the next thing down here is the bomb calorimetry. And these are the instructions for, for doing that. Certainly read through them so you have an idea. I would look up a picture or a guide to bomb calorimetry uh, so you can just have a sense of what that is and what that looks like while you're reading through the directions. And because every setup is going to be a little bit different, I will also go through this when we are um, in class. But this is the procedure that you'll use to measure the energy content of your, um, of your biodiesel. So there, there's some things about it here, and, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, but those are, the, those are the basic documents they're going to be using. So these first three documents are really the main things that you're going to be using right now. The other stuff, the GCMS data, when we get that, I'll put it in that folder. Um, some of the other information that you'll need when we do our calculations and our comparisons will be down here. And we'll get to all that stuff later. But the things to worry about right now are these first three, um, and, and particularly these first two, so that you're ready for the lab. All right. Are there any questions from that? Uh, you can always leave in the chat if you have questions, or on Discord also works. OK, so then let's get into uh, the first part of our analysis. So if we go back to that, um, sorry, I've got too many things open here. actually didn't open the one I wanted. All right, here we go. Okay, um, so we're going to first look at number two and number three because these are uh, based on numbers that you already have. So numbers two and number three are how we calculate the, the mass, so how much biodiesel did we expect to make. And then the percent yield, actually, we don't have that number. You'll get that on Wednesday or the following week. So that's how much biodiesel you actually made. Um, so let's take a look first at this first one. And to do that, we need to look at the actual reaction. So what reaction did we do? And then how do we calculate the, uh, the masses for that? OK. Um, so just to keep in mind, the calculations and the things we're going to be doing, we're doing them together because we need this 
information so that we can decide how the reaction went in our biodiesel synthesis, but you are not responsible for being able to do this on your own. This is not um, in the course objectives. This isn't going to show up on a quiz or anything like that. This is just something we need to do together so that we can get those numbers that we need. All right, so let's take a look at that biodiesel reaction. What is it that we actually did uh, if we were to draw it in chemical structures? So first off, um, we started with vegetable oil or canola oil, which is not a pure substance. It's a mixture of various um, oils that come from this plant. So since we're not starting with a pure substance, it's really hard to write a chemical formula for vegetable oil. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that we have this I guess it was canola oil, right? So we should really keep that consistent. Th we're going to pretend that this is the structure of canola oil, even though we really know that it's a bit different. Um, and so the structure that we're going to use looks like this. So this is how all fats, all triglycerides look. And if this structure doesn't look familiar to you, go back a few weeks to the video on macronutrient structures, and we talked a little bit about triglyceride structures. So this is kind of like the basic backbone of a triglyceride. And then what's going to change is the, the uh, atoms coming off of this carbon, so what kinds of things are going on over there. And again, vegetable oil is going to have a mixture of those things. So we're just going to we're just going to pick one um and the one that we're going to pick actually just to be um just to be consistent there is a document on blackboard called biodiesel calculations and we're going to use that molecule so it's going to look something like this We're going to do uh, 16 CH2s and then ended it with a CH3. So this is just a, a saturated long chain car uh, hydrocarbon. Then this next one, we're going to add one double bond. So we're going to do um, seven CH2s and then a double bond because we know oils are m mostly unsaturated, which means they have these double bonds. And then we're going to add another uh, seven CH2s after that, terminated by a CH3. Again, this is an example of what could be in the biodiesel, but not necessarily what absolutely is. Or in the canola oil, sorry, in the canola oil, because this is what we're starting with. And then for our last one, we'll put in two double bonds. We'll make it um, polyunsaturated instead of monounsaturated. So we'll do our seven CH2s again. So I'm just these are these are just being aligned like CH2, 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 CH2. Then some double bond. Then a CH2 and another CH double bond CH. And then uh, four more. Oops. Four more CH2s and a CH3. Okay, so we're going to call that canola oil. It's a big structure. It's a big molecule. Can you draw a line structure of it? Might be a fun, fun challenge. Um, all right, I don't even have room on the page, so we're going to do kind of like a vertical chemical reaction. And let's think about what we added to this. So what we added to this was methanol which is CH3OH. That one's a little bit easier to, to draw. And uh, then we also added sodium hydroxide. But the sodium hydroxide, though it helped in the reaction, it doesn't, it doesn't actually uh, really show up in the final product. It was more like a, a helper along the way. So rather than write it by itself, we're actually going to put it above the arrow. And if you when you complete the balancing 
chemical equations packet. This might make a little more sense also. So we have these reactants, and then we're going to make our products. Uh, in fact, we need three of these. And so then our products, what happens, if you remember back when we talked about this reaction, what we're doing is we're breaking off this, this glycerol backbone, and we're taking the individual fatty acids and capping them with our, with our methanol. And that's what biodiesel is. So our product is glycerol, which is this. And glycerol is what was mostly making up the waste that you dumped out last week or the week before. So the stuff that came out of the bottom was primarily glycerol with water and leftover methanol and sodium hydroxide, things like that. Um, this is not a fuel that needs to be separated out from the biodiesel. And in fact, one of the big... Um, uh, challenges with the biodiesel industry is like, what do we do with all this extra glycerol? So that's something they have to deal with. So then the other thing that happens, that gets broken off, and then we make these, these we take these big fatty acid chains and we turn them into biodiesel molecules. So they're going to look like this. We're going to add this CH3 from uh, O from the methanol. Seven CH2s, whoops, no, not seven, what is it? 16. All right, and that's its own molecule now. So that's gonna be separate from all this other stuff. It was connected in a triglyceride, now it's broken up and, um, and on its own. And then the other, the other stuff is the other chains also broken up in the same way. All right, and then the final one is this. So notice nothing is happening to these big chains. The only thing that we are doing is breaking them apart at the end and adding this CH3 from the methanol. Oops, didn't mean to have these there. Okay, so CH3. <laughs> I had to put it behind my head to fit it in there. All right, so those are our biodiesel molecules. And we call them fame or fatty acid methyl esters, F-A-M-E, a.k.a. biodiesel. All right, so that's what we made. That's our equation. We took this canola oil, we added three methanols, and then in the presence of sodium hydroxide, we broke that apart and made these fatty acid methyl esters. Um, so just a word about that terminology. This part, this big whole chain part, that's the fatty acid. Um, but if you go back to when we talked about fatty acids, or if you look it up, they always end in OH on the left. And so because we're adding in methyl, which is CH3 is called methyl, because we're adding in methyl instead of OH, that's called a, a methyl ester of an acid. So this is a, a methyl ester of a fatty acid. Uh, one of the ways that we're going to identify this is through a technique called gas chromatography mass, spectro mass spectrometry, or GCMS. And for that, we'll actually uh, put it in this machine, and, and I'll kind of show you how it works. But we will actually really get back the uh, the identities of the compounds that we put in. So we're, we'll be looking for these fatty acid methyl esters as proof that that's actually what we made, that, that we did make some biodiesel. All right, so now that we've got our equation, 
let's talk about how we calculate our yield. Now, the calculation is a little bit trickier. We can't just say, well, we started with 89 grams of oil and we got uh, 80 grams of biodiesel, and so the ratio is just 80 divided by 89, and that's our percent that we got back. It doesn't work that way because in with with molecules, they react in whatever ratio they need to react in. So like every single canola oil molecule or triglyceride molecule needs to react with three methanols. So it has to always react in a one to three way. The other way to think about this is every molecule of biodiesel produces three molecules, or sorry, every molecule of canola oil produces three molecules of biodiesel. So we have to account for that as well, that those are going to weigh a little bit different. Um, so there is a document to help you along with this. And uh, rather than, than write it all out here, because as I said, it's not something that you need, that you need to be responsible for, I'm going to download what's already in Blackboard. Uh, it's at the very bottom of the biodiesel folder. And it is called, I just want to make sure I'm telling you the right thing. Um, at the very bottom, it just says ev example calculations. There's another one that says sample equation and sample calculations. You can use that one too, but it was an older scanned in version. It's a little harder to read. So the bottom one, uh, example calculations, seems to be the, the better one. Um, so let me pull this up from here. This also has these, this heat of combustion calculation that we will get into um, later. All right, so the yield calculations are here. And you need two numbers to get all the way through this. The starting mass of the oil, so how much oil did you start with uh, three, four weeks ago, or whenever you made your biodiesel, when we did this synthesis of biodiesel, uh, it would have been, yeah, it four, probably four or five, four, three or four weeks ago. What's your starting mass of oil? That should be in your notebook. One of the reasons we have to keep good notebooks is so that we can, of course, um, see what we, or know later what we wrote down. And then the final mass of biodiesel is what you will get uh, this week or next week when you come to lab and you take out your final biodiesel and weigh it. All right, so this red one you may not have yet, but the one up here you should have. And if you don't, you may have to do some subtraction. Uh, so if you like weighed a flask and then you put the biodiesel or you put the oil in the flask and then you weighed it again, you have to look at the difference in those two weights so that you're subtracting out the weight of the flask and you have that starting mass of oil. All right. So for the rest of the calculation, we have to use this idea of moles, uh, which we may get to this semester, but maybe not. If it's something you're interested in and you want to know more about why this works and why we have to do this calculation, certainly let me know. I'd be happy to um, do another video or meet with you online and, and explain it. But because you're not responsible for doing it on your own, I don't think we need to really um, go through all the details. So what you do need to know is how to actually use this equation. So what you're going to do is you see where it says 89.03 grams of oil. Don't use that number. Use your own starting mass of oil. But then you can go through the rest of these. So uh, maybe I should make a little note here. When you see that number, use your own. Right? Don't actually use that number. Use your number. The rest of these all come from the equation. So those actually will stay the same for everybody. But you'll have your starting amount of oil. You'll divide it by 880 to account for the weight of the oil molecule. You'll multiply it by 3 to account for the fact that we make three biodiesel molecules for every one um, oil molecule. And then we'll multiply it by 295, which is the mass, the average mass of the FAME or biodiesel molecules. So what you get there is something called the theoretical yield. I can move this up a little bit so you can see it. The theoretical yield means if every single molecule of my starting material got converted into my product, that's how much I could make. That's the most I could possibly make. And with chemistry, that's almost never actually attainable because there's always some back and forth in chemical reactions. You're never going fully toward the end. There's also just other issues. You know, every time you wash it, 
like we've done the last, uh, like we did last week and the week before, you're losing a little bit of it. So there's like um, always ways that you would reduce your yield below the theoretical yield. If you're getting a mass, if you get a final mass that's above your theoretical yield, that's an indication that something went wrong, that you've got impurities in there, that something's going on, because you can't possibly make more than what you started with. Um, you can have more mass than what you started with because you can have multiple reactants, but you're never going to get more than your theoretical yield. So that's why it's theoretical. You're never actually going to get that. Uh, most of the time, people's yields are somewhere around 80 grams or so, depending on how much you started with. Again, when we started with it, uh, when we started the experiment, remember, we didn't really measure the uh, starting amount of oil carefully, like in volume. I just dumped some in your graduated cylinder. So however much you started with is going to change your theoretical yield and change your final mass. But we want to get a decent percent yield. So once you calculate the theoretical yield, then you can uh, calculate your percent yield, which is just your actual mass, how much did you actually recover, divided by your actual theoretical, or your theoretical yield that you just calculated. So the ratio between those times 100% gives you your percent yield. And the higher the yield, the better the reaction went. Um, that's an indication that you recovered a lot of, of product. And if you're imagining doing this on an industrial scale, slight differences in percent yield can be actually huge differences in how much product is made. So a lot of what chemical engineers do is look for ways to increase that yield at large scales so that you're not um, losing material to waste. All right, so that's, that, that's those two, the, the theoretical yield and the percent yield that you can calculate here following these instructions. All right. Okay, any other questions about that? Moving on from there then, let's talk about the, the bomb calorimetry and the calorimeter calculations. All right, um, what's that thing? Well, oh, you can't see this. Hold on, let me change my image again. All right, so here's an image on Blackboard of a bomb calorimeter. Um, and it's not a great image, but I think it'll tell us what we need to know. We can look at another one also. So in this image, what you see, um, you see a metal kind of container down here. And then hanging in this rack thing is another metal part with some poles coming out and some sticks coming down and a little cup. Um, and then over here, you see like a bucket basically, and we're not going to use this, this part, so ignore that thing. Um, but what you do is you put a little bit of biodiesel in this cup, and then this whole apparatus right here sits down into this metal container, which is a heavy, thick steel container, and then this is the lid. It gets screwed on the top here and holds all of that together with very, um, very shallow threads and heavy, heavy steel. So this can withstand a lot of pressure. So you put all that in there, and then you pressurize it with pure oxygen so that there's an oxygen environment in there. Um, and then coming from this little pole here, there's a wire that you're going to have like dip down into your um, sample. And that way, when everything's put together, you can actually hook these poles up to an instrument that can send an electric current through it. And by sending an electric current through it, you can heat that up red hot while it's inside, and that will combust the biodiesel, so it'll burn it. And if it's totally combusted in a pure oxygen atmosphere, there's plenty of oxygen around to combust every single molecule of biodiesel, and that means that it's all going to be essentially gone. It's going to be converted into carbon dioxide and water, and there's not going to be any biodiesel left behind. And the energy that's produced by doing that is the energy of combustion of that fuel. So that's how much energy um, it, it's contain it is contained within there. Now to measure that energy, we can't, like we don't have a thermometer in there. We don't have a way of like measuring directly the energy coming out. Temperature is not the same as energy. Temperature, a change in temperature 
can be due to heat, which is a, which is a type of energy transfer. Um, and so that's how we're going to look at it. So what we do is we actually, instead of just doing this experiment on the bench top, we get it all set up, hook it all together, and that's what the bucket is for over here. We put it down into a known amount of water. And by putting it down into a known amount of water, we can actually figure out how much energy is released by how much the water heats up. So let's talk about how that works. This is again in this um, in this calculation thing. Well, actually, we'll get to that in a second. Let's go back to our notes from today. All right. So to understand this, we have to know something about energy and heat. Energy is measured in, there's lots of different units of measuring energy, but the one that we're going to use most often is the calorie. You've probably heard of that before. One calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water one degree C. So that's where that unit comes from. You have a gram of water, which would also be a milliliter of water because of the density. You take that gram of water and you raise it, let's say it's 22 degrees in here, and you raise it up to 23 degrees C. Uh, that's, ta that's one calorie it takes to do that. Um, so if that's the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water, one degree C, then we can always figure out how much energy by heating up water and measuring that difference in temperature. By the way, while we're talking about this, we should also note this is not the same calorie as what you see on uh, nutritional information, like ingredients and things like that. So one, th let's make a little box here, by the way, 1,000 calories is known as a kilocalorie, and that's what we have on our um, on our nutritional informations, which is confusing, right? Because it's a capital C, that's how it's different. If you look at the calorie counts on a nutritional label, it'll say ca calories with a capital C. And that's actually a thousand times bigger than the little c, it's a kilocalorie. Um, most other places in the world use kilocalories, but here in the US we just use capital C calories. So it's a little bit confusing because when we're going back and forth between nutritional information and our, our lab calorie measurements, we have to remember to, to multiply by a thousand. Um, I don't know why I made it, this thing so big. All right, so that's a calorie. So let's like, let's think about how this would work then and how this would help us out. So if we had um, a beaker with 100 grams of water, And we put in a thermometer in there. And it's at 23.4 20 degrees C. OK. And we want to know how much energy would it take to take that same sample of 100 grams of water and raise it, let's say, one degree. So we raise the temperature of the water one by one degree. All right, how many calories does that take? Well, we can think about this ratio. If it takes one calorie to raise one gram of water one degree C, how many calories would it take to raise 100 grams of water one degree C? It would just be 100 times that, right? So it would be 100 calories of energy, little c calories of energy, is what it would take to raise 100 grams of water by one degree. Let's say if we wanted to raise it by two degrees, well then it would be 200 calories, three degrees, 300 calories, and so on. This ratio, or this idea, um, is expressed in this equation which is uh, heat called heat of combustion. Q stands for heat, 
I don't know. It it just does. And heat is the total heat is always going to be the mass of the water that's being heated times the change in temperature and then times this last term which is called the heat capacity. So how much energy does it take to raise the temperature? The heat capacity equals one gram, or sorry, one calorie per gram degree C for water. And we're not going to be heating up anything besides water. So for our purposes, that's always going to be one. Um, I guess that's not quite true because we are going to heat up the calorimeter, but we'll talk about that in a second. All right. So this is how we heat, this is how we we measure heat. Essentially, if you heat up some water, you can just take the mass of water and multiply it by the change in temperature. How much did it change? Did it go f up two degrees? Did it go down three degrees? Did it go up 10 degrees? Whatever. Um, and that gives you your heat. So that tells you how much energy uh, went into that water. So Knowing that, then we can think a little bit more about how that calorimetry experiment is going to work. You're going to combust your biodiesel inside of this thing. It's called a bomb, but it's not going to explode. Don't worry. It's just called that it because it can resist a lot of pressure. It's going to combust inside there. It's not going to look like anything. You're not going to see anything. But what you will observe is that the temperature of the water is going to increase a certain amount. Not a whole lot, like a degree or so. And so what caused that temperature to increase? It was the combustion, the breaking of those chemical bonds. And so that exothermic process put that energy out into that water and raised the temperature. Um, and so that's, that's what this equation is telling us. And so the total, to get the total amount of energy that came out of that calorimeter, we need a little bit more uh, information. And the reason is because yeah, we can do what we just talked about, and we can talk about how much energy heated up that water, but there's also this huge hunk of steel in there, and it took energy to heat that thing up too. And that's what we call our heat that's going into the calorimeter. And then there's also the wire itself. Remember I said there was a wire inside there that we're going to get red hot to start the combustion. And that's giving off energy that is not coming from the biodiesel. So we need to correct for that energy from the wire. Uh, so we actually subtract that term. So we've got these three terms here, the heat from the water, the heat from the calorimeter, and the, and the heat of the wire. And each one is calculated um, under here. So you can use your own data from this Wednesday or the next Wednesday, and we can um, and we can take that to say water. Uh, so the heat from the water is the mass of the water, and everybody's going to be using 4,000 grams every time. I'll show you how to do that in lab. And you multiply that by whatever the change in temperature for each time that you do the experiment. So if the water goes from, uh, as we set up before, 23.4 to 24.4, then you just use one, and then your heat from the water is 4,000 grams. The heat from the calorimeter, we need to know the heat capacity of the calorimeter. How much energy does it take to raise the temperature of the calorimeter? And those numbers are in the folder in a document. That's so you have to know which calorimeter you have. They all have labels on them. And then you can just look it up. Um, so then we, and then we multiply that by the change in temperature as well. And then the wire, uh, we just, you just have to know how much wire you're using. And you multiply that by either 2.3 calories per centimeter or 1,200 calories per gram. And that tells you the, um, uh, depending on how you measured it. So if you measured how long of the wire you used, you use this first number. If you put the wire on the balance and measured it there, then you measure the second number. And then your energy density is that divided by the grams, and that should be grams of biodiesel. Each trial, you're going to use a slightly different amount of biodiesel. So it'll be around half a gram, but we want a really precise measurement. So it might be like, 0.532 grams or something. 
and that's what you put in here. So whatever you get from this first equation, this blue equation, this total heat, you got to divide that by how much biodiesel you used, and then that number should be fairly constant from trial to trial. And based on time, it's just time dependent how many trials we can get. Uh, sometimes they don't work great and you have to redo them. Sometimes you get three good ones right off the bat and it doesn't take too long. All right, so that's the basics of the biodiesel calculations um, and the calculations that you will need for the project. So let's go back and take a look at that and talk about what we just did. All right, so here's our um, biodiesel project again. We talked about how to calculate the theoretical mass of biodiesel and the percent yield of biodiesel. Um, I think I think for this class, um, just because of how we don't have much lab time, we're going to not do this part. So just do the first part, just the theoretical mass of biodiesel and the percent yield of the biodiesel. Don't worry about the other stuff. And don't don't worry about this before break. That was from the spring semester. I didn't forget to change that. All right. So then, and we do the, the percent yield. Then we also, if we come down here, whoa. We also did number seven and number eight. So we talked about the heat of combustion. I guess we didn't do number eight. We did number seven. How to calculate the heat of combustion using the bomb calorimetry data. And if you're following along here tonight. Um, I hope this is making sense, but if it's not, wait till we do this in lab, and then we'll be, you'll be able to come back with your actual numbers, and it might make a little more sense. And if it doesn't, then we'll, we'll talk about it more. Number eight, percent recovery is like percent yield, but not in a reaction. So in this case, heat of combustion, we know what biodiesel is supposed to have in terms of energy density. We know it's supposed to be, uh, we have a, some literature values, and that's actually, I'll show you that in a second. So we can compare to that in the same way. We can take what you got and then divide it by the literature value or the known value and express that as a percentage. And that might be more than 100% because it d just depends on what we made. Um, but that's going to be your percent recovery. So let me show you where to find that information. That is also in the biodiesel project folder um, right here, this fuel table. So this fuel table gives us a nice look at data of a bunch of different fuels. So you can compare what you got both to commercial biodiesel, but also to other types of fuels. So you can notice on the top here, there's gasoline, there's regular diesel fuel, methanol, ethanol, uh, methyl tributyl ether, propane, natural gas, hydrogen, and then biodiesel, um, commercial fatty acid methyl esters. And then what we want to look at over here is so so different questions in the in the project will ask you to compare some different things things like density are going to be important because that will help you prove that you had biodiesel if you have a similar density to what you'll find here for the heat of combustion we want to use the heating value and i will let you figure out because it is one of the uh, questions figure out whether you should use the lower or the higher heating value but one of those is the literature value that we're comparing against. And that this is where you'll find it. So you'll look all the way over in the uh, far right column here, and you can see the heating values for biodiesel. And when you pick the right one to compare against, then you can, you can do that. Notice, just looking at it, picking whatever values, biodiesel is a pretty decent fuel. Um, compared to, it is not as energy dense as natural gas. So natural gas by weight and by volume is, um, is more, f it has more energy, more energy density. It's comparable, it's a little bit less than gasoline or diesel fuel. So you're having a little bit less energy density, which probably means that when you're using it as a fuel, it is a little bit less efficient in terms of how far you can go on a certain amount of fuel. But if we think about, um, when we think about efficiency, it's not just miles per gallon. It also really depends where that fuel is coming from. Biodiesel is not a fossil fuel. It's not coming from uh, under the ground where it was for billions of years and then turning into CO2 um, in the atmosphere to cause global warming. It is coming from a plant which had sucked 
the CO2 out of the atmosphere and then you're putting it back into the atmosphere. So it's, it's essentially carbon neutral, um, although that can get a little tricky too. So that's why we might use a fuel like that, even though it's not quite as efficient. All right, so I think that, that gets you a good start on the where is my project here? On my on the biodiesel project here. Um, some of the other ones you can start looking at online research-wise. There's some time in the schedule this week to do that because I, I wanted to focus on that this week. So please get those done, and I will see you uh, next Monday. We'll talk about chemical reactions and equations. So thanks, everybody, and have a good night or whenever you are watching this. Bye.